Welcome to your afternoon session where we're going to talk about parallel programming in practice. Um, I'm going, there'll be two presentations, one from me uh, and one from Sophie, um, Sophie Valky. Um, and we'll talk about scaling algorithms, which will be my part. And uh, the second part will be about uh, how you couple different models together. Um, there's no practical sessions uh, for 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 this for this session this afternoon. Um, trying to do remote parallel programming tutorials is is, is probably a little a little tricky. So uh, it, it's just a lecture, I'm afraid. But please feel free to do ask questions. In general, we'll we'll take them at the end of the session at the end of each presentation. But if if it's relevant, we can take a question in, in the middle. So yes, my name is Chris Maynard. I do two things. I work at the Met Office where I'm a, something called a scientific software engineer. And I'm also an associate professor of computer science at the University of Reading. Um, so my background is more in maths and computer science than say me to be. Uh, so what am I going to talk about? So one of the reasons we're having a summer school like this is because uh, the way the computers are, are changing. Um, and you might think of this as the end of the free lunch. What, there was a free lunch? Did we miss it? No, we've been having the free lunch of buying a faster computer for quite a long time. So this is a uh, kind of uh, the idea of Moore's law um, that uh, every, uh, every short period of time, say 18 months or so, the, your computer used to be, um, uh, <clears throat> twice as fast as, as, as the previous one. So you get this exponential growth in computing power. Uh, Moore's law itself um, actually relates to the number of process uh, transistors you can get on an area of silicon. Um, and in some sense that that still continues, but being able to run the computer faster has, has, has stopped. And so what we have instead of a faster computer is a bigger computer. So, for example, uh, we this is the picture of the Met Office supercomputer lit up in purple for some reason. Um, <clears throat> I think it's supposed to make it look very cool. Uh, it does. Uh, so this is a Met the Met Office supercomputer. It's a Cray. The current machine is the Cray XC40. Um, it's quarter of a million Intel Xeon Broadwell cores in there, and when when it was first installed, it was number eleven on the um, top five hundred list, um, and it consumes just just this just the machine itself consumes three megawatts of power, which is which is quite a lot. Now the reason you know we have this massively parallel machine rather than a, a, a um, um, a single processor that's very very fast uh, is because um, <clears throat> of, the, of the changes that are necessary in silicon electronics, the limits we've hit in actually making things in silicon. So this is a plot from uh, Intel, uh, from Shikar Bakor, who's a senior uh, engineer at Intel, and it was made actually in the in the year 2000. Um, and what it's predicting is that there will be no faster processors uh, from 2005 onwards. And so what we can see, uh, hopefully you can see my laser pointer, yep. So what you can see is the sort of power density at individual junctions, um, and that translates into temperature, in, into heat. And so, in order to um, in order to get the each transistor 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 to still switch, you can't turn the voltage down any further. And if you don't turn the voltage down, and your transistors are smaller, you're just putting more and more energy into the same area of silicon, and so the power density. At, at the, is increasing uh, and you go past the point at which silicon might melt, which would be between the, uh, say, the temperature of a rocket nozzle and um, <coughs> a nuclear reactor. Uh, and so melting your supercomputer is usually thought of as a bad idea. Uh, so we don't have faster processors. So um, we kind of solved the, the microscopic problem by having faster processors, but instead all these extra processors now make more processors. Um, uh, there's a three picture of a three megawatt power supply for the Met Office supercomputer, um, and of course this process doesn't uh, uh, is 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 um, there are still no faster processes in silicon, and so we just consume an ever increasing amount of power. Um, and this is a picture of um, uh, Professor Peter Kogi, 
uh, who's a professor of computer science at, at US University, receiving the best paper award at Intel Supercomputing. Uh, and the paper is titled Update Energy Model for Future X Scale Systems. And the point is, can you get to an exascale of compute performance with 20 megawatts of power? Um, and the answer is no, you can't. Um, you have to look at using different sorts of processors. For example, your CPU, which is the kind of processor we're used to using, uh, is just not is just not power efficient enough. Um, and so here's a picture of Oliver Twist asking for some more. Can I have some more power? No, you can't. You've already used it all. Um, so that, that's a so we're going to be moving to different sorts of machines, sorts of processors, um, and this is a picture of. Uh, summit which was the number one on the top 500 list and now is about the uh number two i think um and this is um uh, it has ibm power nine processors but the main workhorse of it are in fact gpus um there are six gpus in this machine and there's about four thousand nodes so it's a huge machine um with uh, a lot of GPUs in it, 4,000 nodes each with six GPUs, um, 24,000 GPU uh, cards in there. Um, and each GPU is a very parallel device, and that's a lot of parallelism to exploit. So, and this machine in itself takes between six and nine megawatts. So this is the direction of travel we're going in, and this is why we're having to think about how we do parallel programming, because it's just ever more parallelism. Um, what are we actually trying to do? Of course, we need to do some computation and the typical innovation that we see is limited by the amount of computation we can do. If you want to do uh, weather forecasting or climate modeling, then um, the, the limits of what we can compute is, is how fast we can compute that. And, that and so the, the limit of the science we can do is limited by the size and speed of the calculation. So I've just talked about the end of or as it were, we can't compute faster, we can only compute in parallel. Um, but if we cannot compute X and Y faster, can we compute them simultaneously? Can we do, uh, can we do them at the same time in parallel? Um, but then we have a dependency problem. And if Y depends on X, we can't compute them simultaneously. And so this is why parallel pre programming is hard, because you have to take of the dependency and you can't do, um, you have to know what you can do at the same time. Um, so here's a graphic kind of showing the different sorts of things we might want to do with our computing. If we have a finite computing resource, we might want to increase the complexity of the model for scientific accuracy. We might want to increase the resolution of the model. So we decrease the discretization errors we make. The more accurate model, we may wish to uh, increase the duration or handle the number of ensembles in the run. And we probably want to process more observations so we can quickly consume quite a lot of uh, any increase in computing power but now this all has to be done in parallel and of course there are in fact different sorts of, uh, of parallelism and that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon um, <clears throat> so one, one way in which things aren't we might be able to do things in parallel is to exploit what's called data parallelism so <clears throat> the data is then decomposed across our different parallel elements, whatever they may be, um, and each parallel element performs the same action on a different set of data. Um, this is a sort of a single program multiple data or SPIMD type programming model, and typically, uh, certainly um, most lo lots of climate and weather models would do this and uh, exploit parallelism over MPI using the message passing MPI the message passing interface. Um, so this example uh, for us to include data movement, uh, a halo exchange, um, and we'll see more about that uh, later in the presentation. Other sorts of parallelism we could do, we could do task parallelism, uh, also known as functional parallelism, where we decompose the problem into independent pieces. Um, uh, we have for example, couple models, the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, we might have ensembles, many models on perturbed data. We might have uh, something called an IO server, which allows us to do asynchronous offload of data. Um, we might have G CPU and GPUs doing different things, kernel offloads. There's different granularity at which we might do uh, task parallelism. And here's a, here's a graphic showing how, uh, for example, the current Met Office unified model uh, works in terms of the different components. Um, so you have uh, these 
different uh, components running on. So these three would all share the same, uh, we're running on the same grid. We have a, a special thing called a coupler. That would be, so if you like, we'll talk more about how we actually do coupling. We also have the ocean, which runs on a different grid to the atmosphere. And so they get formally coupled together. And so these are the different components uh, in, in, in a, a Earth system model. So another sort of parallelism we might exploit at a much lower level is instruction level parallelism, ILP. Uh, at the simplest, the, the processor will do this for you. It's uh, something like a fuse multiply add. So if we have uh, AX plus B, that can be done as a single operation. Um, most processors now are starting to exploit a single instruction multiple data or SIMD, which combines uh, combined with data parallelism. This is often called on CPUs. It's distinct from the pipeline vectorization on true vector processors, of which a few are still around. Um, and it's very similar to Kerbalas memory S for the CPU, which is then single instruction multiple thread. And it kind of looks like this. Um, this is a scalar operation, which would be uh, if I'm going to multiply two scalars together. Uh, uh, no, that, that, that's a single operation. If I do it as a SIMD operation and the data is arranged in memory so that uh, I have a vector of data of X and a vector of data of Y, and I'm going to multiply them together uh, component wise, I can do that as a single operation. Uh, so that's that's much obviously much more efficient than doing four operations, but it has to be arranged properly in memory in order for that to uh, to uh, to take place. So I talked a little bit about Lewis Fry Richardson. So who is Lewis Fry Richardson? Um, uh, Lewis Fry Richardson uh, attempted the first NWP calculation uh, in between 1916 and, uh, oh, that sh sorry, that should say 1918, uh, when he was a volunteer ambulance, uh, volunteer for the ambulance unit on the Western Front. Um, so he was probably quite busy with other things, but he also did this calculation at the same time he did by hand. He had a seven by seven by five grid, uh, 250 meter resolution kilometer resolution over Europe, and he did the calculation for two three-hour time steps. And it took him about 20, uh, two years to do this by hand, and he got the answer completely wrong. He got the answer completely wrong for two reasons. Uh, so he took the data from newspapers or the pressure temperature. Uh, as reported by newspapers at the ver at the points on, on on the grid from two thousand from nineteen a weather report from nineteen ten, and they turned out to be wrong. Um, so that he was starting, you know, he he had no chance of getting the right answer because the the input conditions were wrong. And also the the uh, current Frederick Louis condition was not known so he ended up violating that condition and actually what he needed to do would to have done six one hour time steps uh in order to 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 do that calculation but you know it took him two years to do two time steps so it would take him six years to do uh six sorry yeah it would take him six years to do um the six time steps so it would have taken much longer however he did recognize that the problem was inherently parallel. And in 1922, he wrote a paper which was entitled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. And this is where he recognized the problem uh, was parallel. Um, and he said that he, he reckoned you could probably do the calculation faster than real time at 64,000 computers. So here is Richardson's 64,000 computers. Uh, computers in 1922 were people, people who computed. And he's already uh, so you know each each person does a bit of calculation for their one particular patch of the globe, um, and they've been arranged in such a way that they're sitting over their region, of the, and they would just uh, the patches to each other with the uh, with the with the updates that they, they would need. So that's the global commu that's communication going on, and there's also lo global communication or synchronization required. So here's the conductor uh, when when bits of the calculation are getting ahead or getting too far behind to synchronize the entire calculation. So he recognized already uh, what, how, how you would do this in parallel. Um, and his his model of computer doesn't actually look that look very different from a modern supercomputer if you just replace uh, people with processors. Okay, so 
so that's kind of the, 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 the where we are and where we're having to redesign all our models is to exploit all this extra parallelism. We have to map our scientific problem onto increasingly parallel and diverse computer architectures, which are not faster, but just more parallel. So how do we build a model? So, you know, build a model, we start with, we think of designing a dynamical core, which is the, the place where we start. <clears throat> um, obvious things we need to think about are the what specific uh, thing that we have, uh, which is a, a globe. And the obvious thing is the geometry, it's spherical. Well, it's not quite sure it's spherical because there's orography, there's mountains that stick up into the atmosphere, but that's a, a, a correction. So the first thing to note is that the atmosphere is thin and vertically stratified. Uh, there is some the Kármán line, uh, which is about 100 kilometers up, uh, and below the Kármán line contains almost all the atmosphere by mass. And above the Kármán line, it's probably not behaving too much like a fluid anymore, more like uh, individual particles of, of molecules which are very widely separated. But that as that 100 kilometer limit for, for the edge of the atmosphere, for, for where it's a fluid still, um, is uh, is really thin. Um, so this diagram here is drawn to scale with a 600 kilometer atmosphere. If I drew it with a 100 kilometer atmosphere, it's just a blue line around the edge. Right? It's really thin. And the point is that um, the radius of the Earth uh, is much, much greater than the depth of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is thin. Um, the system rotates. Um, it's not in thermal equilibrium because the sun only ever shines from one side. Um, and whilst the, the, the globe does rotate, you, you know, it's not in thermal equilibrium. There's an atmosphere, there's a, an ocean, and there's sea and sea ice and land surfaces going on. And there's moist chemical and biological processes. So it's a very complicated system. It's a very complex domain, it's multi-component, and it's multi-scale. Models typically are very large, imagine in the hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code. They're legacy in the sense that they take very long time, so 10 or plus or more years to develop, and they could easily have a lifetime of a quarter of a century or more. So the same piece of software is going to run on these different sorts of supercomputers. They also undergo continuous scientific development. So for example, the unified model, which is the Met Office's machine, has uh, probably about 20% uh, code churn uh, per annum, which then has to be verified. Um, it runs in operations and production, so the, pro the processes are necessarily conservative. Um, this is just scientifically prudent. We don't want to make a change that we don't know what effect it has or can have a container mistake or um, know the providence of the changes that, that, that we make to the code. Uh, so let's have a look a bit, a little, uh, look a little bit, look at that a bit more in detail. So here's a nice uh, site picture of uh, over the UK from February 2011, and we can see lots of different things, exciting things going on. We have different layers of clouds. Uh, we've got different uh, some nice stripy clouds going on here. We've got some other clouds here which are, are more uh, have different structure, and you know we'd like our model to be able to capture all this kind of stuff. So what goes into a model? Well, we have to solve the dynamics. These are the equations of motion for density, humidity, pressure, temperature, and wind mass equation and dynamics. So they are a uh, fairly complicated set of, um, of differential, partial differential equations to which there is no analytic solution. We also have advection and convection, uh, physical parameterizations, uh, radiation, uh, where the energy comes into the system, um, so, and then it reflects and re rates. Um, there's cloud physics, there's precipitation, rain, snow, ice, others, so moisture comes into the atmosphere and then it precipitates out and falls out the sky. Um, there's land surface processes, there's even atmospheric chemistry going on. So there's a lot going on uh, in, 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 this, in one of these pictures. And you've got to couple the atmosphere to the ocean and couple the atmosphere to the sea ice. So we have these differential equations uh, for a continuous system, which we approximate to an algebraic equations of a discrete system. 
All right, so that's the first approximation we make by essentially discretizing the system, which we can then try and solve numerically. So in order to discretize the system, we have to choose how we're going to do that. And so the first thing we need to do is choose a grid. And here are some grids that, are that, uh, that might well be used in atmospheric models. So there's a, a long lack grid, which, grid, which is currently uh, used by the MAPIS uh, structured grid. Um, and the coordinate system is orthogonal, so that has lots of nice symmetry properties. Um, but as you can see, the grid points get very close together near the poles. Uh, this is an octahedral reduced grid. Uh, it's a Gaussian grid. Um, okay, so this is a structure. This is a structure grid that's used by the ECMWF, the European Centre in the IFS model. Um, this is a cubed sphere mesh. Um, so th this is a different sort of mesh to this to, to these ones. Uh, so the new Met Office model, which is called Cohen Alpha, uses mesh in an unstructured way. Um, an American model FV3 used by NOAA uses the the uh, this the same mesh in a structured way. So you can use some of them either unstructured or structured. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Here's another example of um, using. Um, Hexagons here. This is an icosahedral mesh. Um, it is unstructured. Um, uh, it's used by, uh, for example, ICON, which is used by the German Weather Center. Um, uh, um, another model, MPAST, which is developed in the US, uses uh, has these Voronoi stretch meshes. So you can um, stretch the mesh uh, and keep have a global simulation with different resolution at different points. So there's also meshes you can choose. And this affects how you actually then do the the, the 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 mathematics in the computer. So the choice of grid is based on the numerical analysis of what you want, what properties you would like to have in your model. And then they have that has consequences for the accuracy and stability of the numerical method. Um, it also has consequences for the uh, mutation as so, two con uh, con <laughs> two different choices would be to do things in a structured way or as an unstructured way. Some meshes have to be structured, some have to be unstructured, some you can choose. So with a structured mesh, uh, name grid or cells uh, are known by construction. This means we can have direct memory access. So if I want to... Uh, do a stencil type calculation, which here I'm doing in 1D. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, the value of this grid point is updated by the value of its neighbors. But I know where the neighbors are, just uh, the index minus one and the index plus one will get me to either side uh, of those cells. And if it's in multiple dimensions, I can either have a multi dimensional array or I can have um, um, steps that are an appropriate size to get me to. The, 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 the neighbors above and below. So with a structured mesh, I can do that, and that relationship is the same everywhere, everywhere or it's known everywhere. It's good for data locality because I have direct memory access, which is good for caching. But with the geometry of a sphere, this can be pro can give rise to problematic uh, communication patterns. So for example, if your grid points get very close together, then uh, then I've got communication patterns problem in, in, in parallel, which we'll see a bit more of later. Conversely, if I do things in an unstructured way, then my neighboring grid point cells are not known. I need to use a lookup table, and this gives rise to indirect memory access. So I'm going to loop through all the cells in the mesh, and for each cell, uh, I'm going to, where does that reside in memory? I have to look up a map. Uh, and then I have to look up a different stencil map to get the neighbors. So here's neighbor one for this cell comes from the map. Uh, neighbor two for this cell comes from the map. Um, and so I've got this indirect memory access. And that's bad for data locality because caching typically won't work anymore. Oh, sorry, the, the data locality means that um, you can you, your caching doesn't work so well, um, but it does mean we can avoid problematic communication patterns in parallel um, for doing the communication. And so it's kind of like which foot do you want to shoot yourself in? Mm -hmm.
So um, you can choose your grid based on the numerical analysis symmetry properties you desire to give you the, um, but it has consequences for the accuracy and stability and for the computation. We now need a discretization method. Um, so here's, here's some graphics attempting to show the same thing. So in one dimension or uh, two dimensions, I've got my wiggly line, which I'm going to approximate in various ways. Um, so this, this one here is a, a finite difference. So I have the values at grid points and essentially I approximate the gradient uh, of the curve by the gradient between the two points. And the more points I have, the more accurate it is. Um, I could do a finite volume where I take the values over a volume. So uh, here I'm operating uh, across a volume rather than just points. I could go further and do a finite element. So then I'm approximating uh, the, the, rather than points, I've got functions uh, across each uh, for, um, functions over the cell, which I need to integrate over to, to compute that. And I'm going to go further still, which would be a, a spectral a method. Uh, so periodic functions here uh, to approximate uh, the, this curve, as, like various summations of these periodic functions. And these might be trigonometric, they might be hyperbolic, but these functions exist over the whole domain. And of course, all these things I've shown here are the most simplest version of each of these things at lowest order. And they can all be higher order and more complicated schemes for putting the, 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 the beginning of your um, uh, algebraic approximation to the differential operator uh, in, in different ways. We also have to do time stepping. We need to discretize in time. And again, uh, choices of grid, as it were, for the time stepping scheme uh, um, will, will affect how, how we do things. Um, we have to take we have to take account of the quadratrix Lewy condition or CFL condition for stability so the errors don't grow uh, exponentially or go too fast uh, with each time step we make. And that puts a limit um, on the site, on the based on the speed of, of, of the wave and the um, size of the time step as a ratio compared to the size of the grid discretization. So the smaller we make our um, grid, the time steps have to take. Um, so in this case, this is for 1D affection where U is the wave velocity and C depends on U and the discretization scheme and basically it's of order one. But there are different waves in the atmosphere. Um, there's acoustic and gravity, Rosby waves, and they have different wavelengths. They can be treated in different ways in, within the model in order to uh, in order to make um, to gain more accuracy or to make the computation more efficient. There's various different methods. Uh, for example, you might use explicit methods where the solution are to your approximation to the solution on time step n depends on some depends on the solution at the previous time step but you can also do things implicitly uh, where the, your solution at time step n depends uh, some function of the, both the current time step n and the previous one um, so, and also if we're using advection, you can have uh, solve this kind of thing. There's like the Eulerian or semi Lagrangian methods. There's different sorts of methods of doing that. Typically, I is cheap to compute, but it has a very small time step. Um, so you have to do lots of time steps. So it would better be really, really cheap. Um, and the advantage of doing new uh, is you have a much larger time step because you get a much better handle of things. So you can't like CFL you are able to take a much bigger time step because you change the relationships of various things and doing this um, but it's typically much more expensive to compute so you want to you have to either take lots of very cheap uh, time steps or uh, relatively fewer but costly large time steps to get to the same place so the dynamics uh, in so in summary you know, this is not a course on dynamics, nor numerical analysis, but there's just some of the issues that crop up and what they mean for the computation and the choices of discretization, the space for the grid and for the time stepping method, the method, the order, the time stepping scheme and the solution method. These will give rise to different patterns of computation, uh, computational and data dependency and communications.
So there's not really one way or whether scales because the, all these mean that, that they will have different performance characteristics. If you want to know more about the numerical methods and, 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 and how, how they get discretized and solved numerically, then I recommend reading uh, Dale Duran's book on numerical methods for wave equations in geophysical fluid dynamics. And I've just done some of the issues there. But OK, it's not just the dynamics we need to solve. Um, it's also the lots of processes are not resolved at the grid scale that that we have or are not present in the dynamics like radiation for example and all these things have presented in the model and we do this by what's called physical prioritization schemes and all these have to be computed and they update the the values of the dynamics fields each time step um And so if we look at the components for an atmosphere model, typically we have dynamics, which is then mostly dominated pretty much by advection and then uh, uh, the solver when you actually do the solve the, the, equa the equations you've just created. And then we also have to do the physical prioritization. So typically these split into things called fast physics, which are things which are cheap to compute, but they very quickly. So you have to do them a lot. Me, and what are called slow physics, which is typically costly to compute, but they don't change very much, so you can do them much less often. So uh, there are different methods and algorithms for putting this all, 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 all putting all these things together in different models. Um, and these next uh, images are taken from crossing the chasm, how to develop weather and climate models for the next generation of supercomputers by Lawrence et al. References there, which just shows you three different examples of how these things get put together. So this is high level views of a time step. Um, so this one on the DL model gram, this one is the ECMWF model IFS, and this one's the Met Office mo unified model. They've got the similar bits in, but they do things in quite different ways and how they get put, put together. So um, IFS does the spectral transformation, do lots of calculations, transforms back, does a few things, and, that, and, then, and, then, and that works. It's obvious one um, is, is a bit less linear, but there's, you don't do the same thing every time step, um, depending on what's happening, and this one's for the, the GFL. So they've got all the similar components in, but they do them in a different order, depending on the, um, how, how the, the calculation is, is structured. It's a complicated situation. OK, so parallel scaling then. So I'm just going to, uh, oh, I'm not going to do that. I can't control what I'm trying to do. Yeah, so I'm just going to check to see if we've got any questions going on. don't think so. There might be one. No. OK, so. Are there any questions on on the you know what what goes into a weather model and then while we're we're having to redevelop them to exploit more parallelism and then I'll go on to the next section which is talking about um, parallel scaling. I don't see any question, Chris. So I think you can go on. Okay, great. Okay, so. What is scaling and what do we mean mean by that? So, so the uh, start my pointer again. There we go. Right. So, what do we mean by scaling? It's how well does the program perform uh, in terms of how quickly it runs um, when I use multiple parallel elements to do the same calculation. So there is such a thing called Amdahl's law, which P is the proportion of a program which is parallelizable, and then S is the maximum speed up achievable compared to the serial code. So um, the maximum speed up achievable is given by one over one minus P. So uh, for example, here if this is the time how long it costs time it takes to do uh, 
execute a particular program and there is a portion which can be done in parallel which is uh, three quarters and a portion which is done in serial which can only be done in serial for dependency reasons and that's a quarter in this particular example so this is how long it takes in one with one process processing element if i use two then I can halve the time it takes to do the parallel element. So then equals two, this green section is, is chopped in half, uh, but the serial element still takes the same amount of time. So actually, if I'm using two processes, the speed is only a factor of 1.6. So if I double the number of processes again to four, I can again half the amount of time the parallel uh, programming takes. And now the progr programming uh, element actually takes less than the serial element, but the total speed up is limited by the serial element um, to uh, this this number here, 2.286. And now if I had an infinite number of processes, then the parallel section is in, in effect uh, instantaneous. But the serial section still takes the same amount of time. And so I've actually only achieved, even with an infinite number of processes, I've only achieved a speed up factor of four. Um, and so, <laughs> that's kind of uh, Amdahl scale. So, what we want to do, uh, is to be able to use our processes as efficiently as possible to get the most out of uh, out of uh, out of the scaling. So, this is how the program a program will scale. So, even if all parts of the program are parallelized, um, and so there is no effectively no serial portion, they have different different components. And we've looked are quite complex and different components um, have different scaling behavior due to communication between the parallel elements so it's a bit more complicated than this this simple picture here uh, and so even if our model is completely parallelized and there are no serial sections the different functions will scale in different ways so let's back again think about uh, parallel communication so this is now thinking about um, with a distributed memory system like we have uh, for most of the computers we have so for example the Met Office uh, supercomputer the Cray XC40 there are 6,000 nodes and each node has a distinct memory space so if I need to communicate across uh, between nodes I need to do uh, um, something uh, in order to, to share that information and uh, typically we would do that uh, using uh, the MPI library. Um, so here, here's the pattern. If I'm doing stencil type calculations, which we do a lot in weather and climate, I've got here, for example, four processing elements. Here's their here's their local domain. Uh, but to compute on the edge of the domain, I need the the, the boundary uh, from the neighbor. So that's what's in this uh, dark blue here. And so the communication pattern is called halo exchange because uh, these two swap their boundaries and then and then they can up uh, the, the values correctly and then the boundaries will be out of date and will have to be updated again and they do it in this case in in two in two dimensions so this is local communication and stencil type calculations require data from the neighbor i think i've just said that so this pattern is called halo exchange the stencil size uh, tells you what the depth has to be. Uh, so if i'm going to make a stencil where i approximate my uh, operator to be rather than just over uh, neighboring grid points, but multiple grid points, then I need a larger, I've got a bigger halo depth, so I have to do more communication. And so for example, the semi Lagrangian method will require large halos. But this is local communication, which means it's, it's processing element to processing element, it's point to point, and it's effectively bandwidth limited. So how fast, what is the bandwidth of the, of the network and how much data you need to transfer. There's another sort of communication we can think about for uh, distributed memory systems, which is the global communication. In global communications, all the parallel elements take part. So for example, that might be reductions, uh, typically a global sum that we see a lot in iterative solvers. Um, and this is latency bound. How long does it take to send a message all the way across the machine and back again? Um, so it's just it's just kind of the the, the round the round uh, the transfer time. Um, we might have all to all communications, so spectral transformations, for example. These are both latency and bandwidth bound. Uh, we might also think about doing I/O at some point. Uh, 
And so then we have serial data to parallel memory and vice versa, with all its latency bandwidth and raw data rate bound. And so ultimately, we do have to think about the I.O. performance because if we solve all these, if we if we solve our make our models super parallel and they run really efficiently on these super uh, supercomputers that are very parallel, we still have to get the data out again. And in fact, it's a quote from an American computer scientist called Ken Kennedy, which is basically a supercomputer turns a compute bound problem into an I.O. bound problem. So the more efficient we are at computing, the more I.O. we have to do. And in fact, I think there's a whole whole session in this summer school about I.O. for that very reason. There's different ways of thinking about the problem. There's strong, what's called strong and weak scaling. So weak scaling is uh, if I keep the local problem size fixed, so the data size per element is fixed, the work rate is constant, but as I uh, increase the number of processors, then the global problem will get bigger um, the local communication increases across the whole problem but not per parallel element and the global communication also increases in contrast to that there is strong scaling where we keep the problem size fixed uh, and this and in this case are the you know we think in our particular problem size of the globe is fixed we don't make it a bigger problem but the resolution is not so if i go to a uh, higher resolution i'm going to have more um more more grid points or or cells to, to work on um so the size of the globe is fixed that resolution is not so you change resolution as you um if if we um uh <coughs> there we, yeah the size of the globe is fixed i think the amount of work per parallel element decreases so you can you know the calculation will proceed faster because as i put as i scale out and allow more processors to tackle the problem each processor has less work to do the local communication actually also decreases but at a lesser rate than the work does the relative amount of local, local communication will increase and the global communication increases and in what's called the strong scaling regime, the, the communication will dominate and will take longer than the uh, computation. Particularly, eventually, if you have so many processes, then they just run out of work to do, uh, and the whole time is dominated by communication. And that's probably not a very efficient way of solving the problem. We also have different levels of parallelism to think about. So this simple model of parallelism uh typically doesn't map onto um, modern complex processes typically they exhibit multiple levels of parallelism and require multiple program models to exploit them so for example here is a die shot of the now defunct intel knights landing processor but there's a you know there's a lot of uh, processors on on the on the die um, and they also have very parallel elements within them so programming these things is is pretty complicated so typically we need multiple program models uh, so we might need message passing library uh, plus something else where mpi is used for the internode distributed memory communication but then we need some other programming model to programming each node itself with its complicated behavior um, and that's often or usually or can be open mp or for example open acc uh, for programming on GPUs, although you can all now also do that with OpenMP. So if we have a look at some of these different types of nodes, what do they look like? Um, this is the MetOffice Cray XC40, um, so uh, I'm saying it's 32nd on the top 500 list, I'm not quite sure what date I said that. Um, it might be lower than that now, but it was 11 when it was first turned on. So this is uh, um, MetaVersity 40. So there's a dual socket 18 core Intel processor. What does that mean? Okay, so here is uh, an in 18 core uh, Intel um, Dion processor, or Broadwell. And there are two uh, in the socket. So it's dual socket. So here's one socket, here's the other one. It's literally two pieces of silicon, but they connect to the same memory banks so there are two there are so there's 36 cores that can see all these same memory banks so they share 
so these 36 cores so even though there's there's um uh, two sockets or two, two physical uh core um, pieces of silicon they can all see the same memory um but for this one to uh, can see this piece of memory and this piece of memory to go over here it has to take a longer route so there's what they call non-uniform memory access so um, typically we don't look to do shared memory programming across all 36 cores, but then treat these two as effectively as separate nodes. Uh, and that way we kind of hide the non-uniform memory access because uh, there's also non-uniform memory access to go uh, local uh, communication shop over the network with the neighbor on the card or out into the main network itself. It also has a 256-bit AVX SIMD uh, unit on it, so you can try and do some of these SIMD operations. The total machine has 6,000 or more of these nodes. You can program the whole thing as MPI only, but typically we don't. So typically we do MPI to um, either a socket or some portion of a socket, and then open MP threads um, across the remaining cores in that MPI rank. That's a mixed mode programming model. Here is Summit, the machine I talked about earlier, which is at Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Lab in the USA. It is currently number two on the top 500 list. So it's dual uh, IBM Power 9 22 core sockets. So here are the CPUs here. Here's one of the CPUs and here's the other CPUs. Um, and then there are six GPUs. Uh, one two three four five six so this is a massive board this is huge it's really heavy um and there's four thousand nodes of this in the machine um so you have host and device memory which are separate you've got uh, fast uh, passes between them with this nv link connection each gpu has 84 streaming multi four processors and each uh multi streaming multi processor has 64 32-bit cores or 32 64-bit cores depending on how you want to work it there's hierarchy of blocks warts and threads for each gpu you want to use oversubscribed concurrency which means you want to have many more threads running than there are actual physical cores because that's how the gpu works so typically you want tens of thousands of these single instruction multiple threads running per gpu of which there are six per node and there are 4,000 nodes so that's a pretty complicated machine um if you were to, to, to get before that uh so the current number one machine is uh Riken in japan uh it's called fukaku uh it's made from the 64-bit fujitsu arm processors uh, so here's a die photo of um one of the one of the court one of the um sockets um it they're all cpu so there's no um device and host here which makes the the architecture a bit simpler but it's still very parallel there are 42 cores there are four mini numa regions on the chip itself so unlike the met office machine where the numa just comes from the physical sockets um, and the different devices being plugged into those sockets here there's actually numa on board the device itself so um, i can draw the boundary something like this um, for each new region then they've got local memory which they can uh, their fastest access but these cores can also see the other e um, so there's the uh, high bandwidth memory interfaces for each mini numa region um there's various level of cache bits of caching going on here the, here's the interface to the network um and here's the there's another interface to something else not sure what okay so that's a pretty complicated architecture each core has two 512 bit uh scalable vector extension simd units so the sve simd units that you get on arm um that's exploiting instruction level parallelism there are 150,000 nodes at 7 million cores, and the whole machine takes 28 megawatts of power. So that's, a, again, a very complicated machine to program. 
So we have to map our complex scientific problem onto these increasingly complex computer architectures, um, which is uh, a challenge. So let's have a look at how some of these models at scale, how they perform in parallel. Um, so we're going to look at some real model scaling. Um, I'm going to use the Unif Met Office Unified model uh, because I work for the Met Office, so I can access the model and, and, and make some plots. Um, other models are available and have different scaling characteristics, but I'm just going to talk you through the Met Office ones because those are the ones I know best. Um, so this is looking at the UM scaling, and this plot shows the comparative relative scaling of a global model with uh, six kilometer resolution at mid latitude. So there's 2,488 grid points uh, north to south and three feet or so east west for the global model. Um, and that includes the, the, the poles where the grid points get very close together. And comparing to that, we're looking at the limited area model. So um, just a small section of the globe, like for example, over the UK or over Europe, um, has a similar number of grid points. Obviously the resolution is much finer. Um, so if I normalize their relative scaling to the second data point here, they both have similar points per MPI task. So um, in red is the global model. And uh, so as I increase the number of nodes factor by two and then four, eight, we can see how, you know, if I got perfect scaling, then if I increased it four times, it would go four times as fast. So that's the, the dashed line there. Um, and so you can see that the um, the global model and the local model scale differently. So the red is turning over much more than the the, the blue the blue model. Um, we're getting out to quite a large number of cores here. So you know, going towards a hundred thousand cores. So that's quite quite a lot of scaling, quite a lot of machine we're using. Um, and you can see the number of data points per parallel element is decreasing. This is strong as we go to the right. So as we go to the right, the amount of computation is per core is decreasing and the amount of communication is increasing. And what we see is that the different, even the same model on a different for a different grid scales differently. And so what we're seeing is that the global model, because it's got to deal with the poles where the grid points get very close together, is having to do much more communication. And so it's not scanning anywhere near so well. Um, and so this has prompted the Met Office to write a new model um, because the along that grid will prevent ultimately prevent the scanning of the unit model. Um, we can look at that in a bit more detail if we look at the parallel efficiency. So the parallel efficiency is the, uh, um, the time taken uh, with n nodes divided by the time taken with zero nodes divided by the same ratio for the number of nodes. So it's how well does it exploit um, the, the how, how efficient is it using the parallel code. So this is again using the Met Office XC40. It's the same global model. Looking at the parallel efficiency now, it's MPI plus OpenMP with three or six thread, um, and then so we're starting at this point. So with uh, 128 nodes, so that's 36 cores per node. Um, looking for that, that's one. That's the, the start point, and then we look at you know one stays perfect scaling. So the the time step itself is the brown, and that seems to scale okay, but it does drop down to about 80 percent compared on uh, when I get 2,048 nodes compared to 128 nodes. Um, if we break it down into components, the fast physics, the slow physics, the solve, and the efficient physics seems to scale reasonably well. Um, that's because it's not communication dominated. There's hardly any comms, there's no comms, or hardly any comms, or even no comms in those physics, physical prioritizations. The solver has some weird superlinear scaling behavior. That's probably just due to memory effects. As I go to the right, then I've got less work per. Um, uh, parallel element and at some point perhaps yeah, they're not fitting into cache and when I go over here suddenly they are uh, so that's probably that effect we're seeing there it's, it's probably memory or caching effects well the real thing we want to show here is the red which is the advection 
uh, which gets down to oh, almost any bit more than a half parallel efficiency. So the advection is really what's kidding the scaling for the unified model. And that's because the uh, metaverse has a semi-Lagrangian, semi-implicit scheme, which gives it the unified model very great accuracy. But on the long lap mesh, uh, on that grid, that does tend to uh, dramatically increase the amount of communication. It's the advection which is killing the scaling, and it's pretty much you know the finger of blame. So, the 25 uh, resolution kilometer resolution, the grid spacing of the poles is 75 meters. At 10 kilometers, that reduces to 12 meters, and I need further to go to six kilometers. And so, okay, so here's a graphic. So here's the global model, and then here's like the local area model. So the similar advection needs requires large halos and at the poles they need very large halos and lots of communication near the poles is killing the scaling of the model so i can use more processes but it just doesn't will cease to go faster at some point um, so there we go so it's actually you know the the choice of grid which um has many advantages uh in terms of stability stability and accuracy of the model and in terms of the efficiency of communication because it's direct memory access um, it ultimately it is going to uh, stop the model performing well in parallel I missed never mind okay you can also look at trying to make the model more efficient by using MPI on the communication and that's very efficient um, however the open MP reduces the amount of MPI required and the balance of computations. This is a paper given by Glover uh, Cug in 2016, Cray user group meeting, looking at running with. Uh, so this is um, looking at the cost of scaling. So then this is looking at um, how long the model takes in seconds for the different components. Um, and then if we double them, basically double the number of. Um, no, that's more than double. Uh, if we take more. Um, increase the number of resources available, then, you know, it scales, we get some improvement in performance. But if we use less OpenMP ranks and more OpenMP threads, then you change the ratios in different places. Overall, it doesn't have much seem much difference because the initial setup is not, not that suited to OpenMP. Um, some of the components scale well, some don't. So, for example, the advection looks much better with OpenMP, but some of the physics doesn't. The solver and advection both have lots of communication, and so the OpenMP benefits. Physics has not so much, but there's lots of loops to thread. As of 2016, uh, a potentially poor load balance, but um, this has been improved over time. Um, and one of the reasons it works really well with OpenMP uh, is the weather is not uniform. Um, it's doing different things in different places. Um, and so this is not at all load balanced, but we can try and get some local load balance using OpenMP. Um, so, for example, looking at the soft, uh, shortwave radiation uh, and looking at how well we, um, if we use segments, whether we're um, messing about with going on with lit points and unlit points, whether or not you need to do the calculation or not, um, and shuffling things around. So this is an illustration of on-load load balance, and when lit points require computation, and so it's unload balance, you can try and recover that by segmenting, i.e looping through a small section of these with OpenMP and then going and get another section when I've done all the work. Um, there is a cost for redistributing, redistributing the work, um, but that does mean then all threads that have a similar amount of work. And so at various points with various numbers of threads, we can see that there is some uh, benefit of doing the segmentation um, and it can be about 20%. Um, depending on if you do the, um, how well you do this redistribution of the data. There's also an I.O. server. Models produce lots of data. Higher resolution means more data. Uh, the I.O. server avoids more computation waiting whilst the output is done. Um, you need the MPI resource to do the output only. It takes no part in the calculation and only controls the I.O. So most of the processors do the computation uh, and then they do an asynchronous offload the data to the, to the I.O. server resources, which write the data whilst the computation continues. So you've got some of the some of the MPI ranks doing the calculation, they get to the point where they need to write it out and they go, right, here you are, shove the data over to those processes and they carry on. And in the background, the IO gets done. 
And how many IO servers to compute the parallel elements depends on machine characteristics, the problem size, the diagnostics selected, i.e. how many things you're going to write out, and the compute speed compared to the IO speed. Um, of course, actually, the IO performance itself. So this is a, a take, this is a plot provided to me by Julian Kunkel, uh, running on the DKRZ supercomputer, showing different number of IO servers throughput for different numbers of client the amount of io for different numbers of clients and servers processes per node and various tunable io parameters read write uh, you can get for up to you know different different performance characteristics depending on what you're doing uh, there is an entire section uh, in this summer school on io so i will defer most of the io discussion to there so the uh, Lack of the, the problems balls long lack of will ultimately prevent the UM scaling um, and changing the grid changes everything. So in about 2010, the Met Office started a new program to uh, write a new entirely new weather model using uh, a different mesh um, and uh, some applications. Uh, um, there is a, a paper which details the dynamics, uh, how the dynamics is going to works, um, and the mathematics involved. Um, and here is a paper more about the whole model and the software. Um, as two references if you want to know more. Um, so basically, um, the gung ho dynamical core runs on a cube sphere. There are no singular poles like the long lat. Um, not there isn't a long lat grid. Um, it's uh, an unstructured mesh, um, and so it could use any mesh at all. Um, but the one we're using is this cube uh, mixed, a mixed finite element scheme um, to try and uh, get the C grid type discretization uh, to generate this exterior cal cal calculus with mimetic properties, i.e., that has mimics the properties of the different derivatives in the continuum um, for. Uh, grad and etc and so the different fields live on different spaces um, and again it's semi-implicit in time and the idea is we maintain the accuracy that we had in the unified model but now running on an unstructured grid so we can scale out further um, so it's structured in the horizontal but structured in the vertical so all the um, so it's laid out so that the the cells that are above each other and next to each other in memory, and then horizontally it's all unstructured. And then, so for example, at lowest order, then you have these different spaces, and at lowest order, they're kind of they get associated with the degrees of freedom for for different fields which live on the different spaces, so temperature and uh, pressure and velocity or wind fields live on different spaces, and at lowest order, they are associated entirely with single entities of the mesh, so nodes, edges, faces, and cell centers. If we go to higher order, they get mixed up. Um, and so we always loop over cells, not um, mesh entities. More on that later. So what I'm going to show you about here is how well we can get this thing to scale um, for the Krolov subspace solvers. Uh, in this new new scheme, so we need to solve essentially a x equals b to um, to solve the the, 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 the equations, um, and we build an improved solution based on the previous one. The compute intensive part is the matrix vector for the operator as part of the subspace. We need some sources which are computing the norms of the vectors, and then these have global sums in them. MPI will reduce. The fewer the number of iterations we can do, the fewer the global sums we have to do, because that's the thing that's going to limit scaling. And so we want to look at how we can use efficient preconditioners to precondition this matrix so that we can do as fewer iterations as possible in the in the in the solver to um, to, to to solve the problem. So the solver itself um, is written in such a way with this, this uh, uh, but takes advantage of this abstraction. We have an iterative solver, which might be things like country gradient, by CG stab, GM res. Um, these things need an operator, um, and they can also have a preconditioner, and they have a vector of data they need to solve on. This abstraction we've done in, in um, 
2003 object oriented code. It looks very similar to other linear algebra libraries, Petsy, June, and Trilinios, for example. So, in principle, we could swap out our solver for, for a library solver, although we haven't done this. Um, in particular, we um, have this mixed system that we need to solve, um, which we might do with GMRES for the outer solve, and then we use a sure preconditioner which itself is the pressure solve to solve the uh, just the pressure system which then feeds into solving the whole system um, and we might and we're looking to use a multi-grid solver here allows for easy implementation so this 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 um framework allows for an easy implementation of a sophisticated nested solver um, the multi-grid preconditioner can reduce the work for the solver um, which means it's faster and has less global sums and gives better scaling. So what does multigrid do? Um, we use, uh, so we need to solve the, the, the Helmholtz system. The pressure solve is used, solved using a geometric multigrid V cycle. Um, so the H here is given by this expression of this field. So um, with the pressure fields and the, and the wind fields, etc. cetera. Um, and basically we solve it on, um on uh, uh, like the course in the grid and get us a uh, solution on the course grid and then come back uh that down to the fine that finer grid and use that as a starting point and that's how multigrid works um we only do the costing in the horizontal uh, we have to do an exact tri-diagonal vertical solve each time as well and how well does it go using this um multi-grid solver and the reason for doing it is we reduce the number of global sums we need to do in the Krylov subspace solver. So this is for uh, a C192 cube sphere, so that means there are 192 uh, cells uh, on each panel of the cube sphere, so 192 by 192 uh, on each panel. There are six panels on the cube sphere, there's 30 levels, that works out at about roughly 50 kilometer resolution. It's dynamics only, something called the baroclinic wave test, running on about two, uh, 64 nodes, two, two and a half the cores. Uh, it's got six M, one with six MPI ranks, six open MP threads, and we're looking at different sorts of solver. So um, the, look at the fall of the residual um, with the Krylov subspace solver for two orders of magnitude, for example, and look at before and after a three level v cycle so this is the amount of time it takes to do the solve for the total and for the pressures so you can see the solve takes different time depending on what accuracy we do the solver to so if we increase the tolerance of the Krylov subspace solver from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 6 that's a much more accurate solve it has to do many more iterations until it takes much longer to do um, but the question is is how accurate you need to do the solve probably not ac accurate maybe only this Desperately. And then you can compare to um, the, the various levels of the multigrid. And you also notice that um, the reason we think 10 to the minus 2 might be accurate enough is because we don't need any extra time in the outer solve, even at 10, if we do 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 2 compared to 10 to the minus 6. So uh, um, you can see that just doing multigrid on, on its own um, and not taking and then just taking the multigrid preconditioner solution as the answer is actually probably good enough and it's way faster then we can look at how well it scales so now we're going out to a c1152 mesh so that's each panel of the cube sphere is at 1152 1102 and there's six panels each with 30 levels that gives us about a nine kilometer resolution again it's dynamics only uh, the baroclinic wave test running for 400 time steps it gives us a time step of about 205 seconds that means our acoustic cf number about eight um using the intel compiler again this mixed mode six mpi ranks per node six open mp threads per rank so we're going to look at running on 384 cores which is 13,000 mpi uh, cores out to three and a half thousand nodes which is 124,000 cores and so this probably the number of elements per parallel element so per M open mp thread per mpi rank will be 24 by 24 times 30 levels 36 sorry 16 squared 12 squared and 8 squared so down here we really are pushing into the strong scanning regime 
So we're going to look at three different solvers. And the multigrid solver has three levels for the multigrid inner solve, and it's preconditioned only. So there's no you're just taking the multigrid as the answer. Comparing that to the Krylov subspace at 10 to the minus 2 and Krylov subspace at 10 to the minus 6. So this is looking at the whole cost of the whole solver, both the inner and the outer solve. Um, the bottom panel is parallel efficiency, and we can see how well they scale. So you've got multi grid Krylov subspace 2 and Krylov subspace 6. Um, and you can see that they're not, not solving. Uh, parallel efficiency is not is not is not super great, um, and it does jump around a little bit. That's because of network network variability. The channel shows the relative cost of the Krylov subspace solvers compared to multi grid, and so that that means uh, higher it, it, it is is um, means costing more time. So that means a bigger saving for multi grid. So the scaling for the whole thing. Is okay, but not great. Um, and you can see that the multigrid is always uh, at least uh, is at least, I guess, three times as fast as the fastest Krylov subspace solver, uh, if not four or five times. It could be as much as ten times faster than the twenty to the minus six, because it scales a bit better. Um, if I look at the inner solve itself, so this is just where multigrid is working, then we see a much bigger difference, obviously. Um, so if we look at, so now we're just comparing the cost of multigrid itself. Um, so we can see that uh, multigrid is the blue line, which is scaling apart from the fact everything's jumping around a little bit due to network variability. Um, you, you were seeing that the, the blue, the multigrid has got pretty good scaling, even out to three and a half thousand uh, Co uh, nodes, 126,000 cores. So it's scaling really nicely of subspace uh, because there are no global sums here. Uh, and the Krylov subspaces don't scale so well because they've got these global sums. And if you look at the relative cost in the top panel, then it's about 10 times faster here than the best Krylov subspace solver and 25 times faster than the worst performing Krylov subspace solver. So that's really, uh, really impressive performance from, from and so picking the right algorithm uh, really, really helps uh, with the scaling. And so multigrid is a much more efficient algorithm than just in Krylov subspace solvers on their own. If we look at the communication costs, then we can see that um, here's the local communication. So uh, MPI sends and receives that they do reduce as they go down, uh, as we scale out, which we, we said before, but um, not by very much. Um, and so they, because um, the halos basically get smaller as we go, as we as we scale out. Um, and it's kind of the same for multigrid and for the Krolov subspace. Well, look at the global communication. And this is where multigrid really wins, of course, is because there isn't any um, in the multigrid solver itself when there is in the Krolov subspace solvers. And so there's a massive reduction cost to doing the global sums, and that's why multigrid um, wins and scales. If we look at the, the, the time step, then um, it's a really interesting thing, um, is that for multigrid, of course, it's a fixed procedure. It's a fixed cost. And so no matter how big or small I make the time step, multigrid costs the same amount other than network variability. Um, um, whereas the Krylov subspace solvers is when I make the time steps bigger, I've got to, the solver's got to do more work to 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 get the solve. And so um, as we push out with the time steps, the Krylov space solvers take to to, um, to solve, and so at the moment we've got as far as the Krylovs of of of, of, of the, the algorithm being stable with a CFL condition number of eight. If we get it out to sixteen, then Krylov subspace these things will increase, and multigrid, of course, won't because it's a fixed procedure cost, um, and then it will be there will be even better performance for multigrid. This is what you see here as the time step increases, the condition number of the matrix increases and so the more iterations are required but the multigrid v cycle cost is fixed so as long as the solution is good enough there's no increase in cost to increase the site when you increase the size of the time step which means i'm doing the simulation faster so that's blue here it's a fixed cost for multigrid whereas the quite subspace solvers uh, increasing cost as i increase the size of the time step 
Okay, so that's looking at the solver. Um, we can look at other communication costs as well. So we can do things like redundant communication. So if we have a degree of freedom living on a shared or partitioned entity like this, so this is uh, across a device, divide, uh, the memory. So in order to compute this value, I need a contribution from this cell and from this cell. Um, so I can, for example, redund do redundant computation into the halo. Um, and so this cell effectively gets computed twice, um, but then it doesn't need to be communicated. Um, so that means there's less communication. And then we look at using different algorithms, whether we're going to do MPI only, where the four MPI ranks will have halos, or I could do it hybrid, where one MPI task as one MPI task has a bigger halo, but four open MP threads share the work of the, the halo. And the boundary to area scaling means there's less work for the open MP threads to do, which is what we see here. So this is the pure MPI version. If I redundantly compute into the halo, I avoid doing the communication, so that's good, but everyone's got this amount of extra work. Whereas uh, if I do it with um, mixed mode, this is all on one MPI rank. And so the extra halo boundary gets cut up there between the four threads and the amount of extra work done in the redundant communication is much less. Uh, and which is what we see here. This is the, uh, the vector scaling, uh, sc uh, scaling of the matrix vector routine. Um, so with a fixed resource, so um, it's the same number of, uh, cores taking part but whether i do them as open mp or mpi changes so this is increasing the open mp and reducing the number of mpi and you can see that the redundant communication is just much more efficient because with open mp threads because there's less open mp there's less uh, redundant computation to do we can take that chris uh, 12 minutes left. yep okay great um and we can take that further by doing redundant uh, computing what we call annex DOFs, um, and that's typically uh, if you want to set the value real to a scalar or a calculate again, and we can do that redundantly, that really big reduction in the number of halo exchanges. Um, and so we change the ratio again of, of compute and, and, and computation, um, and then you can see how that scales. Um, if we look at the cost of advection itself, again, doing this with this mixed mode um, uh, process, we can see that um, the advection for um, the with the new dynamical core, um, okay, looks like on the right plot, looks like it's scaling really nicely here. So this is the cost of advection with different numbers of threads. So I change the number of nodes, uh, R is the parallel efficiency, um, and so one is perfect scaling. No cat is modern, modest, but we are entering the strong scaling regime in this test because this is two to the eight is not a very big number. Um, you can do look at the other way around and look at uh, fixed nodes uh, for 12 and 20 uh, and six and look at the OpenMP scaling. And we can see that the OpenMP scaling is really nice. And in fact, the six threads looks like being the sweet spot for the best performance for the ad section. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly skip through the next slides, but we can also, using the DSL approach, the whole point of this is that we are using the DSL approach, we are using Cyclone to generate all the parallel code for the different programming models, um, then we can also try targeting GPUs, um, which we are making some progress in, I unfortunately don't really have time to tell you much about that. Um, other than the fact we're looking at doing it with open M open ACC for GPUs, um, I'm probably not going to get any details there. I, if anyone's got any questions, I will. We can also, in principle, target things like FPGA. So, um, um, work, some work has been done on taking the, some of the kernels of Elfric and running them on a uh, on an FPGA. Um, which is a different way, a different sort of processor entirely. Um, and some progress has been made in Cyclone in how you translate high level Fortran code into some into the into um, into something like um, OpenCL, which can then um, 
you can pick up the FPGA tools from there. So we do have a route to potentially doing this using Cyclone, although we can't all do it yet. Um, and you can see that we're getting some reasonable form looking performance um, out of uh, running an Elfric kernel uh, on, on an FPGA. So I'm going to just move to my conclusions um, and take any questions that we have. So the end of the free lunch, sorry, excuse me, the end of the free lunch, there are no faster processors um, and there won't be any faster processors in, in silicon electronics. There will only ever be more parallel. And so, and exploiting parallelism is hard. Um, the mathematics of the problem dictates what can be computed in parallel. And the choice of how we solve the mathematics of weather and climate leads to different parallel algorithms and their implementations. And there's an interplay between implementations and the parallel algorithm. Um, we've looked at the scaling of algorithmic components for each time step and how we get to exploit newer architectures, which require ever more parallelism in order to do it. Um, and hopefully I've uh, showing you some of the issues involved and how we are attempting to solve some of those problems at least for um, it at the Met Office. Uh, I'm going to stop there and see if we've got any questions. So thank you for, for listening and hopefully you found that, uh, hopefully that was uh, informative. Okay, thank you Chris. Uh, I see that Elliot is writing. Julian is thanking you. Okay, we have a question by Elia. Do you see it or should I read it? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. So uh, Elliot says, oh. hello, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Will the slides be uploaded on the website or are they private? No, they can, they will be uploaded. Okay. Do we have any questions? Don't hesitate to ask questions. That's what a summer school is for. A question by Sayoni. Uh, yeah, okay. So what is latency bound and bandwidth bound? Okay, so you're asking what does that what does mean or what things are latent bound or, or, or bandwidth bound? Um, <clears throat> assuming you meant, meant the former. So latency bound is, is latency means how long does it start to um to to to, to, to do something? So for example, um if I, I've got a a, a, a loop um and as i start to go around the loop to do the calculation the data is is not on the processor it's in memory and so there's a process by which the um the memory um um the data is transferred from the memory to the processor so i can actually do the cap so i can actually you can do the calculation a bit at, a bit at a time now the process of getting starting the process getting getting that data is called latency. How long does it take? How latent is it? How long does it take before you start saying, I want this data before it actually starts turning up? And then the rate at which the data is delivered is the bandwidth. So um, when you're doing a calculation, the data movement is, is the cost of the data movement is both latency, how long does it take to start arriving from when you first requested it, and how about speed at which in subsequently Lives is the bandwidth, and they're two different things. And different calculate different parts of calculation, whether they're just to local memory or to remote memory, will be either latency bound or bandwidth bound or both. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. And another uh, mention that weather is not uniform. Uh, and also mention a late, uh, late point. What, what is late point, please? <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I didn't quite hear. Oh, you mentioned that the weather is not uh, uniform, okay? And then uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, late, late point uh, to, uh, to, to, in this problem. So what is the late point? Uh, okay, so let's go, I'll just go back to some slides. It's lit point, L-I-T. Yes, okay. yeah. yes, yeah, got that. So, okay, so we're thinking about um, 
so his his the point about this is the physical prioritization thing uh, things happening in the physical prioritization seem to often happen whether it's cloudy like you know if it's cloudy you're not going to process you're not going to get any sunlight coming through or less light coming through um and so and that's not uniform so when i take a here's a here's a, here's, a, here's a chunk of the globe quite a big chunk as it turns out but i could try and do this on one processor um and then as i loop through all the grid points okay so here it's it's not under cloud so it will be sunny here it's under cloud so it won't it won't be sunny so you have to do different things in those different different parts so this is what they mean by so this is what they mean by lit points and unlit points so lit points are where the radiation is, is, is going to hit is going to is going to interact because there's no cloud or there's not, not enough cloud and an unlit point in this case where um the um there's a cloud in the way which blocks the sunlight so you don't have to do anything there does that make sense yeah of course thanks um... any other questions okay if not i guess we'll stop here uh, we reconvene in half an hour at uh, half past three for the second part of this session, which will be more on uh, code copying. So thanks, Chris, and uh, see you in uh, 33 minutes. Okay, oh, thanks. We, we, we may have another question. Okay, I don't know. yeah, I can take that. Nihon. Yes, someone is uh, writing. Let's just see what, what's up. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, he's not writing anymore, and I don't see any message. Okay, well, I guess if you if anyone has any further questions, they can always just email me. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chris, and.